it looks like there are 31 people here. So um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our medium session. Uh, this is a Q&A with authors from the Pragmatic Bookshelf. Um, so we have Ricardo Girardi, uh, who wrote Powerful Command Line Applications in Go. Um, Ken Cousin will be joining us. Uh, and I'll, I'll introduce him when he gets here. Um, Ashley Peacock, who wrote Creating Software with Modern Diagramming Techniques. Say hi, Ashley. <laughs> Um, there's Mike Riley, whose latest book is Portable Python Projects, and Carl Stoley, um, his book is Programming Web RTC, so he's trying to um, help me keep from making mistakes on this. <laughs> so um, anything that you want to ask, you can type it in to the Q&A on the right-hand side, and I will... If you don't specify who you want to talk with, then um, I will go ahead and assign that question to one of our authors. I need to announce the Q&A again. There you go. Any questions yet? No. I have a question. Okay, Mike. How did the other authors get involved with writing a book? What made them choose to decide, yep, you know, there may not be a lot of money in it, but uh, uh, there's some burning desire, a passion to let my voice be heard. So what was that, you know, trigger point that made you decide it's time to write a book? Well, why don't we start with Ashley? Because I, I know the answer to that question for Ashley. My so I didn't really think about it until Margaret uh, reached out to me. So I was writing short form content on uh, on Medium, all about programming and all that kind of stuff. And Margaret reached out, being like, "This would be uh, a great thing to maybe turn into a book." And the article obviously was about um, diagrams. And I thought about it, and I thought, "I don't know if I can write a book, but I can certainly give it a go." So I, I pitched it, and uh, then I, I managed to write it, which was which was nice. And what you guys. It's very popular, so we're quite happy that that, that all happened. Um, Carl, do you want to answer that question too? Yeah, I, I think it's always about you know responding to some kind of actual need. Like it's nice to have like these romantic ideas, like my voice needs to be heard, but really it's about trying to solve a problem because a, a book is a whole lot of commitment, and it's very difficult to bring one over the finish line. Um, so it needs to be filling a real need for people, I think. Um, and it's, you know, it takes a while, not just to, to craft what the topic is. Um, in some ways, that's the easy part. But then you're figuring out like how, like, you know, what level of audience you're presenting it for, what press is going to be the best place to situate a particular book, you know, in just in terms of like, you know, what other kinds of books are published there and all of that. So it, it's, you know, that constellation of considerations and then sometimes like the very first book i wrote was sort of like you reached out to ashley it was the same thing i had an editor from a press approach me about some other stuff that i'd worked on um and so that opportunity just kind of fell in my lap it helped that at the time that was it was material related to some classes that i was teaching and it was like oh yeah it would be nice to like actually have this thing like be in book form instead of like a scattered pile of notes and articles and stuff that i would like assemble for a class so that's my long-winded answer Ricardo, how about you? How did you get started writing a book? Yeah, so um, I agree with Carl. Uh, to me, I think it was a little bit of a call of, uh, of um, uh, I felt a need. So I was working with Go at that time, and there were many uh, great Go books um, you know, out there. But I felt that Go was a different language, and, and, and I was missing something um, on it, like how to exactly do things in a more practical approach. And I couldn't find a book about that. And then it dawned on me, said, well, I'm learning all of this stuff. It may be useful for somebody else. So um, I think it may be worth it. And it was always like a, a long dream of mine to write a book. So in my case, I reached out to uh, to Pragmatic and I, and I pitched that idea and, and it got accepted. And, and was... Did you pitch to any other publishers? No, I went straight to Pragmatic. It was my first publisher. And it got accepted right away, so that was awesome. Cool. And what I mean, I, I'm always curious about what makes authors choose 
the pragmatic bookshelf. Is it because that you had a bookshelf full of our books and you're like, these are the kinds of books I like? Yeah, in my case, it was like that. Uh, at that time, I, it was that's a that's a great story because I was reading a book at that time by Brian Hogan, uh, T Mux too, and which is a fantastic book. And and then I I I went in the, the Pragmatics website and I saw you know the uh, like all of the uh, rules on how you can pitch an idea and I decided to 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 do it. And when I my book was approved, Brian ended up being the technical editor for it. So that was awesome. Wow, that is awesome. <laughs> um, Mike, how about you? What what was your first book and, and what inspired you to write it? Well, that was a, it was a long story. I'll try to shorten it up, though. But uh, originally, I was a, a, a book reviewer. In fact, uh, there were some several long dead publications that were once ink on paper magazines. Uh, one of which was Dr. Dobbs. I was a regular book reviewer for a number of different uh, publishers that would be featured in whatever. And uh, a former coworker of mine was, you know, hey, you're a book reviewer. Uh, and I've actually been thinking about writing a book. Um, you know, what are these book publishers that are pretty good? And I'm like, yeah, you know, some of them are pretty pretentious. A lot of them are academic. Uh, but there's one particular publisher out there, Pragmatic that uh, you know, they, they just kind of write like it is. And, you know, it's almost like um, having a drink with somebody in a pub. It's not this, uh, I'm better than you, or, uh, yeah, I'm going to show you why you're wrong. It's more, hey, you know, just take a look at this. Consider these ideas. And so he went ahead, and at the time, uh, he was getting his degree as a, ma a master's degree in AI. Now, of course, this was way before the... Uh, a flurry of activity that we're seeing these days. So it was a little ahead of its time. And at the time when he did submit that to Prague, Prague uh, said, mm, it's a little early, you know, there's not a lot of support yet. This is way before the whole concepts of LLMs and everything else. It was just the rudimentary <clears throat> basics of AI. So I thought, you know, I think I'm gonna throw, he, he kind of said, well, you know, I, I, I got turned down. So I'm like, it can't be that hard. So I went ahead and put together a proposal and Magically, I got it accepted, and it really kind of changed my trajectory. I went from a book reviewer to a book publisher, or to a book author. And that first book was my uh, Programming Your Home back in 2012, I believe. Programming Your Home. So it was home automation kind of stuff even back then. Yeah, way back cool. in the days of Arduino and processing, which was the language, C-like language that you'd use to program the Arduino. So, uh, yeah, that's over 10 years ago. And who was who was the acquisitions person at the time? Was it Andy who was reviewing yep. proposals? Yep. Both wow. Andy and Dave were actively involved. Yep. Wow, cool. So, um, welcome, Ken. Uh, Ken is the author of Machino Made Clear. That's only his latest book. He has like what is it, six books? Ken, how did how did you get into writing books, and what was your first one? Oh. We don't have audio on you. It's okay. We, we'll come back to you. How about that? Is that is that? Oh working? no, we can hear you now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Man, this has been one setting after another this morning. <laughs> uh, the the first book I I wrote was uh, called uh, uh, "Making Java Groovy," and it was about integrating. Ruby programming with Java programming and API. And in fact, I'd wanted to be an author for many years and I'd done a bunch of tech editing for a couple of um, different books earlier than that. And when a lead author on a similar book to that was taking way too long, the editor of that book asked me if I wanted to co-author it with him to try to get him moving. And I, I, I said yes, and I jumped on that. And then if you skip forward a year, I had written like 120 pages or something, and he'd written like five. Oh. <laughs> he turned the book to me. Uh, so then I wound up lead author on that, and then the book got canceled. <laughs> oh, no. Publishing companies, yeah. So I had to take the, what I had and offer it somewhere else. And they, I offered it to the Prags, by the way, and they said no at the time, interestingly enough. Uh, well, Manning took it. And then, of course, Manning is very strict about their 
structure, even though they don't say they are. And I had to wind up writing the whole thing. But that's how the whole journey wound up writing. So you've published with O'Reilly, Manning, and the Pragmatic Bookshelf. Is that? That's right. I, I did one book for Manning, and then I did three for O'Reilly, and then I did the last two for uh, for the Prags. And Mike, you, you've always just published with Pragmatic Bookshelf, right? You didn't uh, have that's anything right. else. Okay. Books and, well, um, maybe something else coming in the, in the future. Okay, um, so I'm wondering, Ken, since you have published with three different publishers, like what's your perspective of like what authors should be considering when they're looking at publishers? What are the factors that they should look into? Oh, well, they should just go with the Prags. That's easy. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're only um, saying that because I'm your editor. <laughs> actually, for me at any rate, a lot of it comes down to the editor. So, and you don't know that until you, until you propose. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to figure out which company to propose, then you look and see if they have any books that are in the same area that you like to write in, whether they tend to uh, help public uh, publicize the books once they're written, whether they offer a lot of support for the authors. I mean, they all say they do, but you can see by their actions, how they actually behave and you can, uh, get in touch with authors online who have already published books for those publishers, because generally authors, even though we have a reputation for being introverted, are generally more than happy to talk to you about the whole process. That's that's a very good point. I hadn't thought that, like, if if you're not sure who to go with, just reach out to an author whose book you like and ask yeah. them. At the time, I was on the on the No Fluff, Just Stuff speaker tour. And, of course, we had authors there from a wide range of, of public publishing companies. And therefore, I got a chance to talk to people who'd been through the process and see how long it took and what kind of effort it took and what uh, even things like royalty rates and, and support and everything was like for various people like that. And that was very helpful for me also. Cool. We have, we actually have a question um, from one of our attendees. And that question is, what is your perspective on open source hardware? Asking this general question because it doesn't have uh, a more specific question. Anybody here involved with open source and have an answer to that? Carl? Oh, Mike, okay, go ahead. Yep, uh, as a matter of fact, I even mentioned about uh, this in a recent Medium article uh, of some technologies to watch. And one of those is the open source plat hardware platform known as RISC-V. And RISC-V is really sort of the equivalent to what Linux is to software. Uh, there is already a lot of activity with RISC-V architecture and you can purchase products from a variety of uh, sources. Asus, in fact, just announced a RISC-V um, uh, compute platform, uh, fairly inexpensive given all of the capabilities that it has. And while the uh, Linux operating system is being optimized for that platform, you know, we're still in the early days, but I foresee in that time, probably five, 10 years, uh, that that is going to be a significant computing platform in the future. So that uh, uh, big, big thumbs up on open source hardware there. Hmm. Okay. Um, we have another question asking, how do you deal with the problem that programming books become outdated so quickly? For example, the Flutter book is from February 2020. That's a funny question because I was just talking with our publisher about somebody who wants to write on Flutter. That that topic, that book, even though it hit sort of at like when there was a lot of excitement about Flutter, it didn't do that great. I mean, so... We're kind of hesitant, like that That factors into it somewhat. I mean, it's not the deciding factor, but um, you know, as far as like, would we update that book? I don't know that the author would be motivated to, even if we wanted him to, be, because it didn't, it didn't sell all that well. Um, so, I mean, if the book does well, um, and it seems to be a topic that people are still interested in, we try to ask the author if they're willing to update it, um, you know, so 
That's the main factor. Is the author still interested in the topic? Have they moved on to something else? Because, I mean, contractually, they're not like obligated to update the book. They can just say like, here, here's my book. And then that's it, walk away. We sometimes do, um, like Ken did for, for Manning, um, we sometimes do get other authors to come in if the author doesn't want to and we think it's important. I think we've only done that a handful of times, like with the um, the pickaxe book, the, the Ruby book. That's, yeah, Noel Rappin took that one over um, recently. So um, anybody else? Oh, Ken, go ahead. Um, just as a comment, I, I've been in that situation where you're writing a book and the technology changes really, really fast. When I was working, I have a book on uh, basically Android and Gradle. And both Android and Gradle were evolving very quickly at the time. And so was the IDE, the Android Studio environment, all of which were changing at different paces. And it was tough, I got to say. I mean, keeping up with the changes because all your figures changed because the IDE changed too, <laughs> and the, the code mechanisms changed. It was just really hard to do on that. Uh, and then, of course, if the book doesn't sell well, then they don't want to update it, even though the, the field has moved on. So it's and by the way, I got approached by another company asking if I wanted to write on um, integrating Java with uh, AI tools. And can you imagine a book that would be more out of date more quickly than that? I mean, holy mackerel, you, you'd write a chapter and it would already be out of date by the time you wrote it, you know? So it's just, it's just a real challenge. You just have to structure the, the overall frame so that you are focusing on the parts that change the, the least you know, and sticking with principles and things like that, but be prepared to have to run through all the figures again or update the code. This is also why, of course, you set up a GitHub repository uh, that it works for the book as it stands, but that you can continually update for the latest version of whatever the software is that you're working with. I mean, all my GitHub repositories, I keep up to date with the current versions, even if that places them out of sync with the book itself. Right. Yeah, I know we're having that. We've been having that problem with the um, programming Phoenix Live View book because that's a moving target. And so, you know, I mean, the authors are doing everything they can to keep up with it, but it's just changing every day, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, the, the programming WebRTC book that I'm writing, like the WebRTC oh, spec like was finalized, like literally the day that I submitted my proposal. Um, and, but it, it even within the last two months, I think that changed the title of the spec, like no new version or anything like that, but that changed. And so that's a quick fix. But yeah, I totally agreed with what Ken's saying about, you know, sticking to principles and, you know, watch the technology you want to write about and, and wait until there's some stability. Like I would not have attempted to try to write this book on WebRTC even two years ago yeah. because there was so much of the spec that was unfinished and you're just asking for trouble at that point. So when you can get some stability into it and when you can think of sort of like the broader things like, you know, maybe Flutter or something like that, that seems like you want to write about, but maybe it's a more generic sort of like how to architect iOS apps or something like that. So sometimes going up a level of abstraction is another way to sort of tackle that particular thing. With the Makito book that I, that came out in, in February, I tried to make contact with some of the core team members and find out when is, because they were planning a major version number release. And I was convinced that they were waiting for my book to come out so they could release it the day after that, you know. But I'd managed to find out from a core team member what the changes were going to be, even if they weren't necessarily locked down. And that way I could say in the introduction, look, it works on all these versions. And if things evolve the way we're expecting, it'll be on that one as well. But it's it's a risk. I mean, what do you, yeah, with that, with WebRTC, I don't know how you kept up with that. <laughs> uh, one little thing, just I wanted to follow up uh, to uh, some points from Mike and from Ken from a bit ago, which was about, and, and Ken, you just mentioned this again, about how important it is to have a network of people when you want to write a book. Like the way that I got involved with Prague goes back like a dozen years or more. Uh, I had read, my very first title was um, Travis Weissgood's Pragmatic Version Control Using Git. And I just, I wrote him 
for like some dumb reason that I don't even remember what it was, but like he and I started a conversation. He had another book that he was interested in. And then he, I just started learning more about Prague with the, with the beta release program. Cause here's the thing that's the hardest for people who've never written a book before. Usually when you see a book, you see the finished thing. It's been copy edited. It's been proofread. It's been published. It's this perfect holy thing that seems like it came down from like another planet or something. And, real writing most of the time your book is like a smoldering mess there's parts of it that are broken there's parts of it that are unfinished and so the more that you can build a network with other writers uh, and see that the more helpful it'll be for you and that's one of the things that's that's how i my first relationships beyond being a reader for Prague because i came a voracious reader but was participating in beta reviews and then ultimately i was invited to start reviewing books for Prague, and i probably reviewed I don't know, maybe five or six books over the period of, of as many years before I even thought I was good enough to write for Prague. Like I even for the WebRTC book, I didn't I didn't pitch to Prague right away because I thought I wasn't good enough. Like so like it was only until this other publisher that in hindsight, I'm glad they didn't take the book. But um, it, it really is those networking connections. And if you can have some experiences around book publishing that are more than like, oh, my God, I've got to write this 400 page manuscript or something, be a reviewer. Beta reviewers, like, uh, for Prague, if it was something, Manning does a similar kind of thing. But, like, in the last three weeks, I've had two separate beta reviewers, one of whom discovered a bug in Chrome, but it was breaking all of my examples from the book. It wasn't my fault. And there was nothing I could do, but I was able to, like, you know, open up some tickets and stuff like that, figure out what's, what was going on. And another person who had basically just caught a little edge case in my logic. And, you know, the book would have gone right to press with either of those things, like not been a problem, not been, it wouldn't have been discovered, but thank goodness for those reviewers. And now I get to actually mention them by name in the acknowledgements and say, Hey, thanks to this person and this person. Um, so don't discount the power of a network and don't discount um, reviewing and just being a really good reader and reaching out to authors as a good first step for writing a book. For sure. Um, so, Ashley, we haven't heard from you um, since the beginning, so I'm going to ask you a question. What surprised you the most about writing a book, like the process of writing a book? I, I think it's probably the amount you go back and edit it. I think before I wrote a book, I wrote a lot on Medium. And because it's short form, even though you might go back and edit it, it's not quite the same as when you do you would do a book because you have one shot, right? If you post it on Medium and someone goes, oh, you've got this completely wrong, you can reply to them, you can edit it with a book, right? It's printed, it's, it's out there. Right. You've got to get it, you know, as best as you can, I think, the, the first time. Um, so, yeah, it's purely the amount of going back over it. Um, but I also think the way that Pragmatic do it with the, the, you know, the hero's journey framework, where um, you know you kind of the hero is the reader and you take them through it. I think that helped me endlessly to write a, a better book. Um, I think that very much really really good. That's good to know because I get mixed feedback about that because I think Ken is nodding his head. He'll tell you it feels it feels somewhat artificial because it's it's a nonfiction book. It's not a fiction book. And if you're calling it a journey, you're probably starting like somewhere in the middle of the journey when the when the person has already accepted the challenge and the challenge is to learn whatever technology it is that you're trying to teach them. So there's like some pieces missing from it. But I think the main idea of it is just that you want the reader to be the central focus of the book and, and remember that like the reader is there to learn something from you and that they're just as smart as you. They just don't know that topic yet. So. Ken, do you want to jump in and say what you think about um, it? It's a long, complicated story. I'll just say that it's one reasonable architecture, if you will. It's one reasonable path. There are others as well. And that uh, the more I learned about, um, I'm blanking on his name, the guy who came up with that whole monomyth. Oh, Joseph Campbell? Yeah, yeah, Joseph Campbell. Yeah. Uh, the less I'm happy about it. It's one of those, you, you don't want to dig it. I mean, he's incredibly sexist and incredibly yeah. biased toward privileged white males and everything. It's just, in, you know, really skewed. But it, if it works for you as a path to help the reader along, then by all means, go for it. Uh, there's, It's not a problem. It's just that 
acknowledging that there are other paths as well that are reasonable approaches to writing anything, you know. Uh, yeah. But I yeah, if it does work for you, then great. Yep. Um, anybody in the audience want to ask a question? We've, we've only had, I think, three or four questions so far. Looks like there is a new question about ethics. Oh, okay, good. Ah. It's not showing up for me. Yeah. It says, uh, here, I'll read it to you if you like. It says, I write a blog on the ethics of writing. It's at Gary Stewart. Uh, do writers on Medium care about ethics? <laughs> do we take care to abide by ethical imperatives in what we write? Um, anyone want to tackle that? I mean, I love ethics. I, you know, in, in, in my career in higher ed, I was always close to like the ethics center and things like that. Um, I think that's a big part of what draws me to, to you know, the tech presses that I love is, is that, you know, uh, Prague, for example, has a very ethical model just in terms of the way that, that, that writers are treated, the way that the process moves forward, sort of the transparency of it. In terms of the actual ethics of what people are writing, I mean, it's, it, it's almost, I mean, because of the, the structure of Pragmatics books, that they are so pedagogical, meaning that they're, that they're oriented towards teaching. I think Ken's point about, um, or I'm sorry, maybe Ashley, it might have been you. Someone just said, like, you know, the, the, the person you're talking to is a smart person. It's not that you as the author are necessarily the smartest person in the room. You might have researched and, and know a lot about this topic, but I think it it is um, in some ways an ethical move, but also a rhetorical move to just say like, hey, we're on this journey together. What if we're gonna learn this thing? And you know, you you almost express your ethics rhetorically because you're making little moves to say things like, hey, you probably already know this, but in case you don't, here's how we're going to set this little thing up so that you're, you know, addressing the reader as a peer, as a colleague, and not as like a kindergartner or something like, because that's the most insulting thing. Like, I, I'll never understand like, you know, certain, you know, books that have the words idiots in them or dummies and how big and popular those books are. And then people will be like, yes, I'm perfectly happy to sit in this book and like admit that I'm a, you know, a dummy or something like that. Like, I don't understand it, but they're very popular. I think, that, oh, yeah, are very. That's, sorry, anyway, I'm yeah, too much, but that's. Yeah, that's I, I worked for Wiley when they, um, when they acquired IDG, which is the, the dummies publisher. And it was like a big deal because those books sell amazingly. They sell like crazy, but it's for a different audience. You know, I mean, the pragmatic programmers are for professional developers. So most of our books are not at that beginner level. They're, they're sort of like at the intermediate level and assume, you know, you know, you've, you've at least done some programming when you, would you say that's right, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, cause we even struggle with that when we try to gauge our target markets for that specific audience. Um, you know, is this a beginner's Java programmer's book or is it intermediate? What defines intermediate? So it's a bit of a gray area, but at the same time, it is, uh, you know, something that the writers have to think about when they're targeting the level of expectations from the audience. How, how deep do we want to go in the rabbit hole of explaining to the nth degree without having to, uh, you know, sort of disregard the time of our more experienced readers. So it, it, it is a bit of a balancing act, but uh, again, that's where the value of the Prag editors come into play, as well as the publisher reviews, because they really bring back, uh, you know, there's some areas that could use a little bit more of improvement. Uh, this does, needs a little further explanation, or, you know, this is a lot of extra unnecessary detail. So uh, when Ken mentioned about or I think it was Carl who mentioned, you know, getting this magic book in your hands. You now that is a product of a lot of work with a lot of people who have invested a significant amount of time to really polish that stone. For sure. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to do writers on medium care about ethics. Um, the pragmatic bookshelf certainly does. <laughs> uh, we we have an ethics panel that you know if, if we're we have any question about something that we want to do or something that you know we are doing um we refer it to our ethics panel so um one, one thing i would add specifically on medium is if you read some of the bigger publications at least they will have statements on their ethics and their guidelines like i'm going to pick better programmers because I, I publish a lot in better programmers and they for example 
reserve a certain amount of articles for more diverse backgrounds, for example. So that's like a really nice thing for them, them to have. Um, and I think there are other ones around. So that's at least one thing I noticed on Medium. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's funny to me because it, it feels like even though Medium says that, you know, their goal is to produce quality content, there are all these, I guess, just human nature things in place that incentivize sort of clickbaity kinds of articles. Um, and then, of course, there's the whole question of like, you know, are people really are there? Are they really writing these articles themselves or are they starting to, you know, crank out articles using AI? Um, but I think there are whole other sessions on Medium about that specific topic. So this one, we're hoping to get questions from you about, you know, writing books um, on technology related topics and specifically for the Pragmatic Bookshelf, if you have questions about that or just in general about like what it's like to write a book, a technical book. So let's see. Are there any more questions coming in? I write in the Dummies series and I enjoy doing it. I try to make the books rich and interesting. Thank you for that, Barry. Um, yeah, I mean, I never worked on the Dummies series, but I was at Wiley during the time when they acquired it and I went and met all of the Dummies editors um, and they seemed like, you know, really smart people and were just, it's just a different audience, that's all. Um, okay, so let me approve this question. Um, let's see, <laughs> all questions, sorry. How do you know that you have enough material to write a book? Um, well, I mean, we have a series that's only 50 pages long and, and you know, 300 words a page, it's, it's not much. So, I mean, just if, if you're like, can I write a book? Yeah, you probably can. You can, you know, start out small um, and do something like the Pragmatic Answers series. Um, and it's generally like 300 words a page. So I'd say just start writing and write about something that interests you and, and see like, are you, are you getting up to that point where you have at least like 50 pages worth of material? Um, and sometimes anybody the else topic, want to answer that? Yeah, sometimes the topic helps you with that because if you're going to write about a particular API, you need to cover the API. If you're going to write about a particular technology area, you need to cover all the major alternatives. So it, it it's basically more of a feeling of you you it's too long for an article or even a couple articles, but uh, it's curated. I mean you 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 put together the overall outline of what you want to talk about and then run it by people. I mean, the Prags will do that for you. They'll run it by a bunch of uh, technology people and say, so, you know, what do you think? And then you'll get a lot of feedback on that. So all you need to know is to get started is to say you have something you really want to say that isn't being said. And just start with that. And these things, I mean, the I, I used to estimate that it took everything I wrote took twice as long to write and three times as many pages as I anticipated at the beginning. So these things grow naturally. Your, your problem will not be, do I have enough? The problem will be, how do I cut this down to something manageable? Anybody else find that they like just had way too many pages, like, or way more than they thought that they would when they were writing? Yeah, so my book that I my book was an express book, so it was limited to 150 pages, yeah. and we were like bumping up against the limit. And my editor was like, "You you can't write anymore, so you need to start like trimming it down and like, you know, deciding what to cut." So yeah, I think it, I think you but can. Who, who was your editor? Would you start pulling, uh, Mike Mike Swain? Oh, Mike Swain, right? Yes, okay. Um, but I think once you start pulling a thread, you'll be amazed how many kind of things you find to talk about. So just yeah, snowballs. Yeah, which happened uh, with me. So uh, the Go book turned out to be close to 500 pages long. And we actually cut at least two chapters from it. So and I think that's exactly what happened. So at the beginning, I said, well, this this enough and then start writing and getting the examples on and you see, well, it's, it's, it's a lot to talk about and, and it turned out to be great, in my opinion, but that there was still more that could that we could talk and we ended up cutting and because it was already too long. 
We have now have another question. To what extent do you modify your table of contents as you go along? Editors seem to want a fixed TOC, but for me, the TOC is only a rough idea. I know, like I have met authors that are just like that. Like the, the TOC to them is just a suggestion of what they want to write. And other people have it just planned out from the beginning because they see it as like a natural learning path and certain topics make sense in that order to teach. So I think it just depends on how you approach writing. What do you, um, Carl, what do you think about that question? Oh, uh, I, the TOC like, as you go along? <laughs> I mean, I always think with every kind of writing project, like I'll come up with a structure. I'm like, this time I've nailed it. This time I'm a real writer and this will stay the same from now to the end. You know, and it doesn't matter if it's an article or something like that. Um, in terms of like the TOC for the for the WebRTC book, that has changed so much. Um, and, and sometimes after the chapter has written, has has been written, like it's not even just like, oh, this is where I need to go next. Like, but I'll, I'll write the thing. and I mean, like, yes, this is what I meant to write, but it doesn't belong here. Like there's some other kind of thing. And, and I think that, you know, the it really is a choice that comes down to what's best for, for as so many choices, what's best for readers. Like this makes sense in my head because I've, you know, been involved with this technology for so long and this is kind of where it would go. But when you try to put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's like learning this from you, you're like, Oh, it would be really cool if, if this person had, you know, 10 years experience in this or whatever, but they don't. And so we've got to kind of shift things around. And so I think, you know, being able to be nimble on something as fundamental uh, uh, as the TOC, like that's, that's really critical. And that it's, it's folly to assume that you can kind of like have that kind of foresight into the future to be like, yes, this is exactly right. Yeah. I'm always terrible with that. I always have, uh, I have a vague idea what I'm going to cover, but the outline, like everything else uh, at the end only vaguely resembles what it looked like at the beginning. And in fact, one of the reasons I liked the Prags is I, they were very flexible about that. I didn't have a, a serious problem with that. I've had other publishers who wanted to lock things down. This was not like that at all. They were very mm -hmm. open to, yeah, this is all going to be different now. <laughs> Again, the page limit was a bigger deal than changing the outline. Yeah, I mean, and the page limit is only a big deal if you're if you're in one of our series that has yeah. a page limitation. Like the Pragmatic Answers is supposed to be 50 pages. We I think we published 75 on the Makita book, 75 pages. Well, and um, also there was also the, uh, on my, my, my management book, the idea was if I go too long, we have to kind of repropose it as a different series, you know, just because it was expected to be shorter and now it's going to be longer. It has to be in a different category. That's all. I don't think it would have been a problem, but it would have changed everything. And it was like, yeah. Okay, yeah. And I think, from the publisher's perspective, one of the issues is that like once you get up sort of in the 500 plus page range, yeah, that's crazy. we really have to charge more for that book, especially, you know, the printed book, because um, <clears throat> it's it's costly to print a, a, a large book like that. Um, so there's, I think, more price resistance these days um, from customers buying books than there used to be. I mean, you know, I remember the days when computer books were like a thousand pages long and that's what everybody expected. You just expected that. I don't even know what we put in them, but they were a thousand pages long, always. Um, but but anymore, I think people wanna just get to the point and, you know, learn something small that they can put to use right away. So, um, well, and, and as things have moved online, you know, there's you no longer need an exhaustive reference in a book form because that'll go out of date very quickly. I usually think of technical books now as more curation than anything else. It's like this is what I think is worth it. This is what's worth your time. This is what's worth your in, your effort to invest in learning. And then if you need the details, you can get that, you know, in the latest version online. Right. Well, I just noticed that we are actually 10 minutes over our allotted time. I don't know how that happened. Think that they would give us a warning, but they didn't. Um, let me go look and see if there are any other out. There are no more questions to review. So um, let's just go around, starting with Mike. And just if you have just a closing thought for people who are thinking about writing a book, and we'll end it there. Mute this out. There we go. Sorry. Uh, 
So, yeah, basically it's the uh, same thing that others have iterated. And it's basically anybody who is passionate about a topic and has relatively decent writing skills can be a book author. It's a lot of work. It's dedicated time, commitment. But uh, as everybody on this panel can attest, you know, they were not authors before, uh, but they became one. And it did take a lot of work, but it's also incredibly rewarding to know that you're able to go through that process. And the most meaningful thing is when you get a email from a reader who you've potentially changed their life because of the way that uh, you've introduced them to a new world, a new idea. And uh, that is probably the most rewarding aspect of it all. Awesome. Ricardo, what's your parting thought for people who might be thinking about writing a book? Yeah. Well, I, I definitely agree with what um, Mike just said. And uh, um, it, it is a lot of work, so it's be, be prepared. It, you have to dedicate the time and, co and commit. It's, there's a lot of back and forth with the editing. Uh, but it, it's definitely worthwhile. Again, I, I had this long-time dream of, of, of doing this and and really uh, receiving some of the comments from uh, from from people out there. And I, I actually had one this week on on Twitter. Some somebody saying, "Hey, you really you changed my life. This was this was great. Thank you for writing this book." And that's really you no know, more rewarding feeling than that. Awesome, Ashley. What are your parting thoughts? I would say, I think for me, Medium was a really good way of setting me up to write a book. So I think if you can write a few articles on the topic that you want to write a book around, you'll, you'll get some feedback from like readers, comments, you know, you can see how popular they are, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's a really good way of like dipping your toe in, I guess. Um, and then if you want to submit a proposal to Pragmatic, you need to send in a sample chapter. So that's also another really good way of seeing if you can actually write content about the book, because you have to write an actual, an actual chapter. So. Yeah, we we try we've tried to loosen that up a little bit so that like if you've written a few blog posts about that topic that your book is related to, um, and especially if you've if you're already an author, we we kind of like let that sample slide now. I know it used to be a, a stricter thing, but um, Carl, what are your parting thoughts? My parting thoughts. This is especially for technical people, whether you're a software developer, or engineer, or whatever, um, is to work on your writing as seriously as you do your software craft. Um, the best people to write about a topic, you might think it would be the person who knows the most about topic X. That's not usually the case. Um, most of us have a lot going on and, and, and it'd be, you know, it's, it's an impossible thing to ask yourself to become like the world expert in whatever. The question is, can you learn what needs to be learned, draw from your experience that you have, but then also take that extra step that sometimes the best experts don't have, and that is to communicate things in a way that's engaging really well. So treat your writing seriously. Use every opportunity, whether that's a commit message that you're writing, an email at work, or even just a Slack message. There's always a chance to, to, to improve your writing, to be a more clear writer. For me, my handicap that I've had to overcome is that I was an academic writer. So I could write you a sentence that's, you know, 20 lines long or something like that and every punctuation mark known to man is in there and for me it's like how do i just say subject verb object just do, do, do. this is the thing and, and none of these like crazy inductive sentences so so treat your writing seriously and always look for opportunities to improve it awesome i know why i know why ken had a little giggle there at the end um because i'm his editor but what what are your parting thoughts ken Oh, well, just to try to pick a couple of things that have not been mentioned, because I agree with the ones that have. Uh, first of all, it always looks overwhelming when you start because you're at the base of a mountain. But uh, actually, a better analogy is it feels like you're emptying the ocean with a spoon. But you do a little bit every day. And, and believe it or not, after a month or two, you look out there and it's now a lake and, and then it becomes a pond. And it really does get smaller and, and you do get there. Uh, also, uh, be prepared that it the final product won't look anything like you're imagining when you start it everything changes even if it's a presentation i mean i gave a presentation for years the same presentation over and over again then i went to write it in book form and it all evolved just because the very act of writing it down helps you think it through and changes it uh enormously 
Um, and then the job of the editor is to, you know, part of the job of the editor is to give you feedback. And if you don't know what else to do, I mean, it's going to sound silly. Um, I find that if I have a gag to tell, if I've got some joke to tell, then I'll probably write pages and pages just to tell that joke. And then the editor could go, yeah, that wasn't funny. And we could take that out, but I still have all those pages left, you know? <laughs> so it, it, then we can and use them for medium articles. Exactly. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> so at any rate, all of those things. And, and it's, also having a book is your membership card. It's, it's, you walk into a company as a consultant and you see your book on somebody's shelf, your rate just went up, you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> not to mention, you know, you get the community of authors and, and people who are just well, very friendly, welcoming group is at least in my experience. Yeah. I mean, I, I found that I've been working in publishing a long time and all of the authors I, I've worked with, I still remember like my very first author that I worked with, Gary DeWard Brown. He wrote on job control language. Um, oh, wow. So yeah, you 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 meet a lot of great people when you publish a book, I think. So I hope that people out there will join us and submit a proposal. Um, it doesn't hurt to try. The worst that can happen is that we say no this time, but try again. So. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you to the audience and have a great rest of your Saturday. Bye.